And we are uh, blessed today to have Peggy and Jim Plews Ogan with us to talk about ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, but also more generally about how to live with purpose and meaning in the face of difficult circumstances. Now, both of them had um, a career in medicine, and I think, Peggy, you're still teaching, is that right? At the med school, and uh, Jim was uh, a professor there for many years and a pediatrician for, I believe, over 40 years. Um, so let's get started with a general question, make sure we're all kind of all on the same page. Um, what is ALS? How would you describe it for lay people? It's a great question because most people don't know about ALS. Um, and part of the challenge of this disease is that it's been in the shadows for many, many years. Lou Gehrig, how many have heard of Lou Gehrig's disease? Yeah, so he was the one who first made it famous. Um, and then it kind of receded. And then how many of you remember the ice bucket challenge? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, that was another time when it kind of, re kind of surfaced into the public awareness, but then kind of slid back down. Um, and part of the reason is the nature of the disease. So this is a neurodegenerative disease of the motor neurons, so the neurons that control your muscles. And it's progressive, usually fairly rapidly progressive. The average uh, time from diagnosis to death is between two and five years. Um, you lose the ability to, it, it can start in many different ways, and I don't know, it reminds me of in the, in the early days of the rheumatologic diseases when we called it all rheumatoid, um, and now we know it's many different diseases. ALS has many different pathways we know now of how it's caused and how it manifests, and it can manifest initially as many different in many different ways. It could be in Jim, it was his left hand that he felt was kind of weak and not well coordinated, um, but very subtle. It can be your speech that goes. It can be your swallowing. Um, it can be your walking. Um, but Basically, it's a degenerative disease where you lose all motor function eventually. Um, so you're unable to, to move or swallow or speak, um, which you can imagine is pretty devastating. Um, and unfortunately, because it's fairly rapidly progressive, you can see why it's stayed in the shadows for, for all these years, um, because most people affected by the disease don't have the opportunity or the wherewithal to come out and start speaking about it. And the caregivers are so busy caregiving that they don't have that time either. So um, it's a, cha a really challenging. And I have to mention that your eyeballs are, are, are still good. <laughs> so, so. So I'm going to hope that Jim mostly does the talking. I'm, I mean, I'm going to translate for him, but because um, he always he, he always says things better than I do. But his eyeballs working are important because one of the ways that people with ALS, even in advanced stages, can communicate is through something called eye gaze, where thanks to technology, you can use the gaze of your eyes to basically. Uh, function like a mouse on a computer. So you can type, um, you can text, you can even do voice uh, to, to eye gaze or eye gaze to voice. So you can bank your voice and then you can use your own voice um, to, uh, for certain phrases or even to type out a word and then the computer will say it for you. So the fact that your eyes are working is very important. And they always will. For some reason, the eyes are almost 100% of the time protected from this motor neuron disease, which is kind of fascinating in and of itself. Jim, can you tell us a little bit about when you realized you had ALS, what maybe some of the first symptoms were? Um, how did that develop? Yeah. Well, Two years ago, 
I did not. I did not talk like this. I did not talk like this. I was as I was an associate professor and had just had just published a paper with a student of mine. Who was with me in South Africa? It had amazing. I had a, a amazing a missing mission. <laughs> Sounds like I had a. Something busy, private practice, and I had just stepped down as the founding CMO of a startup, and my five my, my running time was getting faster. It's been a runner all his life. So you had very active professional life. You were publishing, you were still practicing, you were still functioning as a professor. And you physically, it sounds like you were in great shape. You're and my left thumb got weak. Ah, oh, and that was the first sign then. Okay. And I had uh, some, uh, he started having fasciculations. And my mother. Fasciculations are like twitching of your muscles, uncontrolled. And my wife. And my it's, I won't translate that. <laughs> it's a doctor. The best doctor wow. in the world. <laughs> and very, very smart. And she got worried. That so you picked up on some of this and thought, the combination yeah, of fasciculations and weakness makes you think. In general, it takes at least one year for most people to make the diagnosis. I'm one of the earliest that my neurologist at Mass, the one at Mass General, had ever seen. The other one was oh, the other early diagnosis that this neurologist had seen was a sharpshooter. Oh, interesting. And had noticed something in the in in their uh, finger. Anyway, it's it's very um, common for the diagnosis to believe, be delayed. For people to have surgery um, as part of the misdiagnosis. So one of our campaigns is actually to get the word out about this diagnosis. How do you know for sure that you have it? What what do you, do you see? A scan that shows clear evidence of it? What what's the sign that you can say, yes, I, I have ALS? Oh, yeah. So um, it's it's not an easy diagnosis to make, um, but there are criteria. And probably one of the most important is, first of all, ruling out other things. But secondly, um, an EMG, an uh, electrical uh, study of the muscle nerve connection, can pretty much make the diagnosis. Um, but some of it, you have to make sure that you're ruling out anything else. Yeah. Okay.
Um, let's transition a little bit to some writing that you've done about living with ALS, but I think more generally about living with difficult circumstances or changed circumstances. Um, and reading your material, I found a lot of relevance to my life, to all lives, I think. There's a lot of wisdom, as, as you all talk about, wisdom in, um, in how you think about responding to something like ALS or any difficult situation. And you talk about the concept of post-traumatic growth. Pros traumatic growth. Could you say what that is in general? Me? Um, See, he says I'm the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in this room. <laughs> uh, it's all contextual. <laughs> so wisdom. Uh, Jim says I'm a wisdom scholar, so my my research is around wisdom and how people develop wisdom. Um, how many of you have heard of post-traumatic stress disorder? Right. So for many years, we the only thing that we researched about stress was the disorder called post-traumatic stress disorder, the negative effects, the serious negative effects of stress when it kind of outstrips your capability of coping. Um, but um, maybe 20 years ago, um, some smart psychologists started to ask the question, hmm, I wonder if, like in other biologic systems where stress has benefit as well as damage to a system, right? The system changes and grows in part because it's stressed in a certain way. It doesn't matter if it's a tree or a cell or whatever. Um, so these psychologists asked the question, I wonder, what if there is any positive change related to stress, even serious stress. And they asked post-World War II veterans, um, and they were surprised because they thought the veterans would, be, uh, would have nothing good to say about what they've been through. But the fact is that, first of all, they were relieved to be asked the question because the whole experience had, in fact, caused really important growth in them as human beings. And so they started to investigate what does this growth look like? And then obviously, importantly, how do we help people who are going through a stressful situation to come out the other side with the best possible chance for growth? And so this whole arena of post-traumatic growth um, was born and has been and now investigated fairly well um, and we're really starting to learn how you can help people in the midst of serious, stressful situations. So what are some of the positive changes that come out of um, stressful situations or can <coughs> what, what sort of characteristics or traits might emerge in a person through post-traumatic growth? So I bet you could probably guess. Um, when you think back in your own life and you've been through something tough, Think about how it might have changed you in some good ways, although you'd never want to repeat it. Um, but things like a greater appreciation for life, a restructuring of priorities, um, more uh, attention to the beauty in life. So all those things that we might not notice actually do happen in response to serious stress. Yeah. One of the strands that I think you pick up on in, in your work um, is this notion that much of wisdom is not about changing your circumstances, but changing how you look at your circumstances. Um, the ancient Stoic philosophers talked about this quite a bit, um, that our suffering is not so much due to what happens to us or in the world, but about how we look at things. Uh, Jesus himself and St. Paul talk about finding happiness, joy, meaning, purpose, even in the midst of persecution and challenge. Um, so this is a strand that kind of goes through uh, the Buddhist and the Buddhist, yeah, right, in yeah. multiple traditions. Yeah. Um, and I think 
if there was one thing that seemed to really speak to me in your work, it was this idea that um, even with an ALS diagnosis, you can find meaning and purpose in your life if you look at it the right way. But you could look at it with despair. You could say, the life I had, runner, professor, physician, I can't do it anymore. Who am I, right? What's my identity? Or you could look at it, as I think you all are trying to do, as an opportunity to grow into something new, someone new, um, to grow as a person, to develop a new identity, a new sense of meaning and purpose. And to be open to that is, um, in a nutshell, <laughs> wisdom, right? Um, and yet extremely difficult, isn't it, to do that? Um, and in some ways countercultural. It's not the, not the message that we hear in our society. Um, can you speak a little bit to that about your own journey to getting to that perspective? Because, again, I think it is a pretty remarkable way of looking at things. How did you get there? How did you both get there? Well... <clears throat> You make it sound very lofty. <laughs> it is lofty, that's what I mean. I mean, what? Oh, where to begin? Well, first, there is a continual experience of loss and grief. And that is the reality. To cry? Okay, he said, make sure people know I'm not going to cry. So the, the trembling of his jaw is clonus. It's, um, it's neurologic, and so it's not that he's about to cry. <laughs> and his voice is how it is. Okay. I mean, you can ignore or deny the grief. Or you can live with it. And I believe that I've learned to buoy the grief. With with um, the experience that you mentioned, uh, the experience of oh, that that's your that's my research. No, that's the reason. No. I believe you can buoy grief with the positive beauty, love, are the things we're doing. All the things we're doing. You keep living. Mostly, boldly, oh, 
and turbocharged. <laughs> and that boy is the grief. So we have to learn how to hold both things at the same time. So it sounds, Jim, then, that to really get this perspective, this wisdom perspective of life, you do need to face the realities. And it's not a question of denying them and saying, oh, that's just, it's not real or something. But no, you, you face the realities um, that you, we call that acceptance, this yes. kind of radical right. acceptance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the first step. I was struck in your work, um, you talk about doctors who make terrible mistakes in their practice um, and how this upends their self-conceptions. I'm a good doctor. How could a good doctor make such a mistake? Right? I assume you're envisioning things here maybe where medical mistake leads to someone dying, right? And the consequences are quite significant. <coughs> and yet even in those circumstances, if you, if you face that, if you're accountable, if you accept the truth, that maybe goodness, or your goodness as a doctor is a more nuanced, uh, <laughs> complex thing, and it's not black and white, right? That there's a gray there. Um, you can emerge as a effective doctor afterwards. You can still have purpose and meaning and significance as a doctor, even in the face of this great difficulty, but it starts with acceptance. It, ex it starts with grief, living in that grief. I think that's what you're saying, is that the two have to go together. Uh, you have to face things as they are to really be able to reimagine what they mean. And then you and then you have the choice yeah. Yeah. to step in. Yeah. You all uh, cite the work of uh, Viktor Frankl um, in his uh, famous book, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, Viktor Frankl, of course, was uh, in a concentration camp, experienced the horrors of the Holocaust, I believe lost family members, um, and spent much of his um, adult life reflecting on how to find meaning and purpose even in the face of those great tragedies. And he picked up that stoic wisdom we talked about of it's not these circumstances themselves, but um, your choice about how you want to look at them. Um, so let's, let's think about how we can encourage people to make that choice. Um, what advice, recommendations would you have based on your experiences um, and your research for, for us and for all people who are trying to uh, make sense of their lives, accept realities, integrate new truths? How do, we, how do we make that choice? How do we live intentionally, boldly, and supercharged in that way? What do you recommend? For me, it really has its roots or foundation in daily contemplation. Do you have specific practices you do to um, kind of encourage and promote that contemplation? I have to think about it. I don't have to think about it. I don't think. I, I do think about it. No. I don't think about it. I do it. Yeah. Um, so you just you you say I'm going to make space now to contemplate. Every day. Every day. And, um, and now that I am, 
Yeah. Now that I am in the in the wheelchair. Now that I'm so still and quiet. I have lots of time to contemplate. <laughs> So in a sense, it's um, making the space in your life, carving out that space, um, stilling your mind, maybe letting the mm. thoughts come in and out, right? Mm. Not uh, fixating on any particular thought. Um, sounds pretty similar to prayer. Mm -hmm. um, would, you, would you call it that? Do you think that that's what you're doing? <laughs> I think it's a form of prayer. Yeah. You know, what I would say from my perspective is one of the things that's been key is community. Mm. Um, the ALS community has been some of the most incredible people that I've ever met. They, I think because they are facing this, this situation, those who have stepped in are just extraordinary. And they gave me the courage to do that. Um, and, you know, when I lose whatever energy I had, you know, just being with them, uh, even on a Zoom call when they're all typing in the, in the uh, chat using eye gaze, it just, it just blows me away. Um, the the way that they have taken this tragedy in their lives and really kind of turbocharged to you know make the world better, if not for themselves, then for other people. Um, so I've taken a lot of a lot of encouragement and energy from the community, and I think too the community is not. Um, you know, they're, they're also some of the most brutally honest and, you know, talk about Speak acceptance. Speak truth and yeah, love. Right? The, exactly. Um, so they, they just have given me a lot of strength. Um, I think also we've learned personally and through the research. But it's not a one and done. <coughs> it really is iterative. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, Lawrence Calhoun, who is the researcher who first kind of wrote about post traumatic growth back 20 years ago. Um, we made a film, and in the film, he says, Yeah, you know, this post traumatic growth stuff. One morning you wake up and you're all about post-traumatic growth, and the next morning you wake up and it's like just as uh, just a big bunch of crap. Right. <laughs> Vacillate between both and that's stances. Exactly, yeah. That's exactly how it feels. But to not get discouraged that that when it all feels like a big pile of doo doo, that the next day it's going to be better, and um, and that's partly what the community can do. Um, and what we have been able to do for each other and our, our family um, and our caregivers, meaning our, you know, our medical caregivers, um, that is something I, I want to get to because I think it's important. Yeah, yeah. I think also naming, naming the grief. And everything ALS in your face. That is right now. In an hour, it'll be different. Yeah. I've been gazing at the beautiful high. I will be gazing at the beautiful hyacinths, yeah. and so. And that, and that gives you strength, I think, knowing that 
you might be in a dark place, but you're going to be in a different place in the future. Mm -hmm. You just keep holding on. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I believe. God is with us at every moment. I, I really hold that to be a reality. There is, an, every, every moment, there is an opportunity to do, to know God. The other, this is not just words. Yeah. One of the really beautiful things that has happened is the way that the community has supported us. Before we open it up to uh, questions from the group, um, I want to ask sort of a technology question. Just curious. Um, the eye gaze is a fascinating technology. Um, is there some sense that uh, the revolutions in AI might uh, transform um, how people with ALS are able to communicate in the future? Um, is that something that's being explored and investigated? Already. Already. Yeah. Yeah. There are people who did not voice bank. So voice banking where you record your voice and before you lose it. Yeah. Which Jim did, but some people don't. And now AI can pull together their voice from various sources. Yeah. And, then, then, um, and then they have a bank of their own voice. Yeah. There was uh, something I saw a couple months back. I don't, I don't know if this is going to materialize, but um, they have been able to do brain scans on people and uh, translate the neural images into images depicting real images, pictures that people could see, just based on neural scans. Interesting. Uh, very, very remarkable. So, um, they, cer next, they certainly do have yeah. you know, um, computer interfaces so right. in, to the brain. So right. in an implant in the brain that if you just think about moving your arm, if you have right. a setup that will move your arm, you can think about moving your arm and it moves your arm. So we're getting there. That's but, what I'm wondering about is, you know, so yeah. I know that with ALS, the, the mental capacities are still there. Right. Pretty much till, till death. Yes, thank you for saying um, that. You gotta believe it. You better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Supercharged. <laughs> All right, well, let's, uh, let's see what questions we have from the group for uh, Jim or Peggy. Yes? What the hell? Where is the research being done on those types of illnesses? Well, most one, important. There are many now research projects going on across the country. Um, what? The, across the whole world, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it was made very slow progress for thirty or forty years because it was really terribly underfunded compared to other diseases. Um, with some new funding through the Act for ALS, which was something that we've been involved in, um, and the funding from the the old, uh, it's fairly old now, the Ice Bucket Challenge, kind of, it did kind of get some research going that was not going at all before. So we're starting to see some of the fruits of that, but I think in the next 10 years, there's gonna be a lot of progress on not just ALS, but also Parkinson's and Huntington's and lots of these degenerative diseases, the, oh, no. all the basic science is going to apply to all of these diseases. 
So it'll be, um, I don't know, maybe like heart disease 40 years ago or cancer, you know, 30 years ago. I think we're going to see a lot of, a lot of progress. Oh, big research at MGH. Not MGH, Columbia, Northwestern. And many clinical trials. And our UVA has been very active in the clinical trials. Do we know what uh, causes ALS? No. No. Okay. So could it have a genetic basis? So we do know there are, oh gosh, now there are almost 40 different um, genetic issues that have been identified, some very direct. Um, so there's a very small subset of ALS that is clearly genetically, genetically uh, related. Um, but then, you know, 90 some percent of ALS is called sporadic. There are many genes involved probably, and so maybe like cancer, it's, it's a two hit thing. You have a genetic susceptibility and then you have a second hit of some kind. Unfortunately, the people susceptible, most susceptible um, are people in the military. We know that. Um, that's a high risk group. Um, to people in the military. Who had a military experience, like a trauma, uh, you mean a combat experience? Any, yeah. Due to, they are too, or up to eight times more likely. So the Department of Defense is now getting pretty interested in um, what this is all about. What other questions do we have for Peggy and Jim? This isn't really a question about ALS, but Peggy, I, I don't know if this is in the materials about you, but isn't it correct uh, when I first met you, I think I knew that you had gone to divinity school at Yale? Yeah. Oh, is that Before right? you became a doctor? I just think that's an important part of your background. Yes, I, I, I was going to be, I, I was probably going to, I thought I might be an academic uh, in religion or philosophy. And maybe even more relevant, my senior thesis in college was on the problem of evil mm -hmm. and suffering. So I've been, I've been thinking about this for, yeah, yeah. 40 some years. I'm also a graduate of YDS, so oh, really? a fellow alumni. <laughs> that's, that's, um, wonderful. What other questions do we have? Yes. I have a friend who was recently diagnosed with MSA. And so, I'm sorry, so she just found out a couple weeks ago, and I guess it's a similar neurodegenerative disease. And I've just been wondering how to support her, and I'm wondering if you have advice for you know, close friends for the things that were sort of the most helpful and, you know, what not to say, what to say, what to, how to be there, because um, she's got, I guess, with her, they say it's about a seven to ten year window after diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'm sorry. Um, it's so hard, and the, probably the hardest part is that jarring, that jarring first little while when you're, when you're, it's like an earthquake happened that, you know, basically everything kind of falls apart. Um, I can say what was really helpful to me, I remember sitting, my, after, right after we got the diagnosis, my son was sitting with us. Um, my daughter was a resident at Master and she hadn't gotten home yet. And um, we were talking about the diagnosis and my son looked over and said, well, we've always been, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of take charge family. 
I guess it's time to get turbocharged. Mm-hmm. And we have, we have kept that with us the whole time. It's what has allowed us to live like we do in the world now with this diagnosis. Um, so like Jim was saying, for me it's this, this combination of accepting the reality of what's happening and still having this, this force of moving forward. I, I, we were not, many people who get the diagnosis of ALS are told by their doctors, unfortunately, go home, get your affairs in order, eat all the chocolate you want. Well, that's not us. <laughs> you like chocolate? <laughs> Give me a day or two of you chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, your friend is going to be is going to be <coughs> trialing, trying, trying to accept. Struggling to accept. And you need to be there as she faces. And you can help her buoy the grief. Just by being there. And then as she steps in, you can be there. And I think the best way to help her or show compassion is to do something you love for her. Whatever that might be. Including helping her with her finances or finding help at home or food or her garden her work her career whatever you love now Live in this time. Live now. Now. Now is the time to turbocharge everything. Right at the beginning. Say what you need to say. Say say you love her. Um, all these things that we think, oh, they'll be tomorrow. <laughs> And definitely, I listen and know that it will be iterative. Yes. And I have to say, our, our friends and community have been, some of them sitting here, have just been amazing at that. You know, it changes as you go through various periods of time. and have someone who listens well enough, who's, who's right by you, um, and who meets that wherever it is you are. And probably people, people, people bring us food. They help with all of our all kinds of things. And one person 
gave you a painting. And I used the painting because it's so gorgeous in, in your contemplation. And she understood how that would be beautiful. Little onesies for our new grandchild. Uh, yeah, all kinds of things. And when we established the Hummingbird Fund, people from all, just all walks of life um, really stepped in and engaged uh, in, in trying to make the world a better place focused around this, this particular neurodegenerative disease. So there are all kinds of ways. The worst feeling, I think, would be to feel like you're alone. So that sense of community, someone walking with you, wherever this walk goes, is huge. Well, we've come to the uh, end of our time today. Let's give uh, Peggy and Jim a round of applause. And thank you for your time. Be willing to stay around for a little bit if you have any additional questions. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.